Welcome. In this episode, we will be examining the nature of reality and how it relates to our experience of that reality. This is a pretty enormous topic, and we certainly won't be answering any of life's fundamental questions in the next 20 minutes or so. But what we will be doing is taking a look at some misconceptions about our own conscious experience and asking some questions about what reality really is and what we really can or cannot say about it. In this vein, we'll be drawing on a lot of work done in mainstream science and in spirituality, mostly Buddhism. We'll be looking at questions like, what is real? What does reality mean? Versus what is perception or actual experience? How are they different? How are they related? What are we doing when we gain understanding or knowledge about something? This isn't an exhaustive exploration by any means, but more of an introduction. Hopefully, in future videos, we will get a chance to delve more deeply into these topics. What is the reason that we're interested in examining these things, besides merely curiosity? The Buddha's Four Noble Truths are the basis of all of Buddhist teaching. They tell us the following, that 1. There is suffering. Obviously, this is true. We're all aware of this. But more interestingly, 2. There is a cause of suffering. And three, there is an end to the cause, and therefore an end to suffering. And finally, four, there is a path that leads to the end of suffering. The root cause of suffering is said to be in the mind. It is the nature of the mind and our perceptions that cause us to suffer. Therefore, it is important to understand these things, if our goal is to understand and possibly end pain and suffering in our lives and others. First, we should note that there is a real challenge in investigating the nature of consciousness and perceptions, what it is, what it is not. Most people feel subconsciously like we are experts on our own conscious experience, if we question its nature at all. We have to overcome our own blind spot on this issue. It's only really when we come up against something that throws our expectations out the window that we start to ask these questions. An example of this might be being fooled by a magician, or viewing an optical illusion, or ingesting a hallucinogenic drug. Then we realize that conscious experience is not exactly what we think it is. One way that we can overcome our blind spots is through systematic observation, testing our hypotheses, our assumptions, seeing whether they hold up under the weight of observation. Meditation is a kind of first-person experiment on one's mind and is a key way to delve into these issues. One has to experience these things firsthand. This is what meditation is all about. There will be more videos later where we will go into different meditation techniques. There's a really good TED Talk by the philosopher Daniel Dennett, link here in the video, that uh, goes over some of these consciousness blind spots that we're all subject to. Noting this, I'd ask you to keep an open mind in this and the videos that follow. Use what's presented here more as a jumping off point to ask some questions about the nature of your own reality uh, with the intention of verifying or proving false anything that uh, comes up in your own investigations. Let's start by looking at the elements of your conscious experience. Note how your moment-to-moment -moment reality seems composed of things like sensory experiences, visual objects, auditory, touch, smell, taste. There's emotions, love, anger, sadness, happiness, thoughts and ideas that are passing through the mind. All of these aspects of consciousness are rising up in the mind. They're living in the present moment and then dissipating. There are also background or somewhat hidden aspects of experience that exist within the forms, within the flow of experience. For example, there's the feeling of space and time that separate objects, and there are things like numbers or the laws of logic. Some schools of thought say that only a single element exists in experience at one time. The elements are rising and falling so fast that they appear as if a continuous stream of experience, like train cars passing by at a railway crossing, or like frames of a film which contain only some limited static information, but when spun by fast appear as a continuous movie. An example of this is vision. We have the perception of 
a rich and detailed visual scene. And the assumption is that there must be a tremendous amount of visual information being stored in the brain. But this is not exactly true. The image your eye is seeing is actually totally different from what you think you're seeing. Only the fovea, the central group of cells at the center of your retina, perceives much detail or much color. And the brain doesn't store a lot of detail. Most of the visual information disappears from the brain the moment you stop looking at it. But conceptual information is stored, and our eyes are rapidly moving between details, giving the illusion that all the detail is somewhere in the mind. When the mind wants a piece of visual information, the eyes immediately go there without you thinking about it. The information is not in the brain prior to this. We can see this, for example, in how unreliable witnesses can be in a trial. Where do all these elements of experience exist? The modern view would be to say that they exist in the brain, that everything arising in the mind is the result of something occurring in this piece of meat between our two ears. But the concept of neurons and a brain is really just that, a concept, something arising in your mind. It is itself a pattern of thoughts or neuronal activity, if you will, which is somewhat of a circular explanation. Really, all that we can say is that these things are arising. They are arising in the mind, in this stream of experience. That's not to say that this idea that we are a brain is right or wrong. As we'll see in future videos, even the concept of right and wrong, or true and false, are things that are somewhat difficult to pin down. Instead, we just have to remain aware that all of this is simply a thought, it's a model. In Buddhism, this concept can be seen as well. For example, the Buddha is supposed to have said, Within this fathom-long body is the world, the origin of the world, the cessation of the world, and the path leading to the cessation of the world. Maybe we can even go further. All that really exists is this present moment of experience. Any sense of past or future or a flow is also just a perception or an idea contained in the present. In some sense this is true, or more precisely it is useful, whether it's sensations that are arising or emotions or memories of the past or predictions of the future. The memory of what just happened is really an experience that is arising in this moment. Did the memory really happen? How can we know for certain when all we have to rely on is our experiences in this moment? Take the example of the Berenstain Bears, a popular children's book series. Many people who read these books growing up, myself included, clearly remember the books being called the Berenstain Bears, not the Berenstain Bears. If you believe this strongly enough, it can be quite a shock to discover the world is not as you remember it. Or consider the following philosophical problem. Most of us have a clear memory of who our parents were. What if a powerful deity somehow altered everyone's memories in such a way that two complete strangers are now remembered as your parents, and you as their child? The people who were your parents are now complete strangers to you, and you to them. Assuming the deity did everything perfectly, no person would consider anything out of the ordinary in this scenario. The only being that would know something had happened would be the deity itself. But what if the deity wiped its own memory as well? Now, what is the truth? Who were your real parents, or does reality not have any meaning in this scenario? A physicist might argue that the truth of the past is stored in the particles and how they're interacting, the physical information of the universe. But the laws of thermodynamics and increasing entropy tell us that this information becomes more and more inaccessible as time goes on. It is fundamentally lost, or inaccessible to anything. In what sense can we say that the information is still there if it is totally inaccessible? This loss of faith in one's own memories, having the flow of experience become unreliable, may seem familiar to anyone who has worked closely with someone suffering from Alzheimer's disease or dementia. This questioning of memory and time can give one empathy for someone in that situation. But there is obviously a flow. There is obviously a sense in which there is a past, a present, and a future which affect one another. Let's ignore the paradoxes for a moment and focus on this flow of time. Much of the information of reality lives in this flow. Take only a snapshot photo of a scene and you lose a lot of information about the scene. Ignore the momentum in the moment and you lose sight of a lot. 
This will be important when we go into talking about the nature of desires, as in many ways these are like a uh, momentum or a push or pull in the present moment. This is seen in physics as well. It is not enough to describe a system by positions or locations of its parts. You need the momentums of the parts as well, how they are moving. Together the positions and the momentums form the phase space of the system which describes most of the physics. In Buddhism, this idea is contained in kama, or karma. There is a karmic seed planted in each moment through ignorant action or inaction, which will, under the right circumstances, give rise to fruit in some future moment, and we are all inheritors of past kama. We will go into this more in a future video on karma. This is like one resolution of the paradox of the ship of Theseus, known as the worm theory approach. The paradox is to consider what would happen to a specific ship if we change one part, for example, replacing a board of the ship with a new one. Does the ship remain the same ship when we change one board? What if we one by one replace every piece of the ship? Is it still the same? The worm theory says that we can't just consider objects as simply existing in space. We have to consider their time component as well. Then an object is kind of like a worm, the body stretching out through time. The resolution of the ship of Theseus, then, is to say that there are two overlapping worm ships that diverge at some point in time. This is explained better in the video linked here. In Buddhism, we see something similar. A monk named Ajahn Chah is supposed to have said, Suppose that you eat some jackfruit and lift out the seed. When you do that, you're lifting a whole jackfruit tree, but at the moment you don't see it. You don't yet know it. If you plant the jackfruit seed in the dirt, then it will start growing. Leaves will appear, branches will appear, flowers will appear, small fruits will appear. But as long as the seed is just a seed, you can't point to these things in there. This is also a quote about karma as well. Buddhism might go even further than this, though in the concept of voidness of objects lacking any innate sense. It might say that the ship of Theseus paradox points to the lack of concrete reality of any object. All of this is to say that there is obviously a flow to reality, a past, a present, and a future, but that these things exist merely as imprints or concepts in the present moment. The experience of flow relies on us trusting the information held in our present moment experience, trusting that our memories of the past are really genuine. And the fact is that we have to trust our experiences. We have to trust that there is a flow to reality, a past, a present, and a future, even though we can't know it for certain. Because if we don't trust it, then everything vanishes, including the concepts that are being laid out in this video. Reality relies on causality and time. But we are actually delving into an important area here. We're touching on the concept of voidness, or the void, which the Buddha talked about extensively, and which we will go into more in a future video. So moving on, there is more than just a flow to reality. There are also patterns within the flow, rules or laws that we can try to decipher. We have the perception of there being some objective reality and other minds separate from us, which we are in contact with, and which have discernible behaviors. Maybe there is an illusion aspect or an understanding that our senses might be deceiving us or that our perceptions might hold some bias. But there's still an objective reality out there, the thing that is giving rise to our perceptions. The problem is, whatever we say about this external reality is always something arising in our mind. It is always framed in terms of the present mental state. It is always seen through that lens. What then is understanding or describing? When we attempt to understand reality, it means we are observing it. We are forming a model, which is then compared against our experiences. If there is a mistake with our internal model, we alter it. This is done in science through the process of constructing a hypothesis, a theory, and then testing it through experimentation. But it is also what all humans do when we learn something. It's said that children are some of the most excellent scientists. But we are still relying on our observations of reality. Is there a true nature of reality that doesn't need to be observed to be real? Does it really matter? 
Modern physics seems to suggest that reality might be constructed at least partially directly from our observations or interactions. The biggest developments in physics of the last century came from bringing focus to the observer, to what is actually being perceived, and questioning the solidity of these external structures absent from an observer. For example, Einstein's spatial and general relativity theories came out of considering the nature of space and time, realizing that these fundamental aspects of our universe are really about measuring devices. Space is about rulers or bouncing lasers off things to measure distances. Time is about clocks. All of these things need to be observed, and generally these observations use light. Light moves through space at a constant speed, so the nature of space and time is tied to the nature of light and our observations. And light is really about causality, and so space and time are intimately connected. Quantum mechanics operates in the same vein, but goes even further. It asks the question, if something is not being observed or interacted with at all, can we really say it exists in the normal way we talk about existence? In the macroscopic world, all things are being observed or are interacting with something all the time, but in the very small quantum world, observing something is the same as interacting with it through bouncing a particle off it or quantum entanglement. And indeed, quantum particles do behave differently when they are not being interacted with versus when they are. This is not to say that they need to be observed by an intelligent entity like a human, but they do need to be interacted with in some way to be classified as real. Still, modern physics, and indeed most scientific and spiritual models, are based on the premise that there is some kind of God's perspective, an ultimate, true, objective reality, which we are all observers of. For those physicists listening, by perspective, I am not referring to a choice of frame, coordinates, or gauge. I am referring to the idea that there is some ultimate truth, a mathematical or physical model, that could be said to be a true model of objective reality, absent all observers. Buddhism would seem to take this view as well, when the Buddha talks of seeing reality as it truly is. But really, the Buddha does not talk much about external reality focusing more on experience over theorizing. As the Buddha said in this very important quote, In the seen will be merely what is seen. In the heard will be merely what is heard. In the sensed will be merely what is sensed. In the cognized will be merely what is cognized. Practicing in this way, you will not be because of that. When you are not because of that, you will not be in that. And when you are not in that, then you will be neither here nor beyond, nor between the two. Just this is the end of suffering. Is it possible that future physical theories might bring this out even more? One could imagine a theory in which what is perceived as external or objective reality is really just composed from entangled perspectives, a physical model which is based solely around the first-person perspective. Finally, there's a few important things we should address. All this might leave one feeling rather ungrounded rather unsure of what is real or not real, perhaps feeling a bit lost. It's important to remember the reasons why we are going over all this, and why it might make one feel lost. Remember that the reason we are examining this is to understand the root cause of suffering, and if there is indeed an end to suffering. Here, fundamentally, the mind is attempting to understand itself, and that is bound to cause some confusion. Of course, the mind plays an enormous role in what we perceive as real, and therefore plays an enormous role in causing suffering. That being said, we're not implying that perceived reality is somehow unreal. We're just attempting to probe the role the mind plays, and noting that every aspect of what we call real is actually an arising in the mind. This includes the concept of, I am feeling lost, or even the I itself, but we'll cover this more in a future video on the self. Remember, whatever the nature of the universe is, it will continue to work whether we understand it or not. The nature of the universe is fundamentally mysterious, and that's okay. It's possible that part of the reason these things make us feel lost is because we want to understand everything. If not everything, it's a deep drive in most people to want to understand what's going on, in our immediate surroundings. It's important to be humble and remember that we understand very little of our reality. 
It seems as though we evolved to survive and procreate and raise our young, perpetuate the species. This has very little to do with deep fundamental understanding of the universe, as is argued very well in this TED talk. It's rather amazing that we understand as much as we do, and that's perfectly okay. But if we want to get to the root of suffering, we need to delve into the fog and confusion of our own reality. Currently, there is somewhat of a movement against experts and authority. Is this what I have been advocating in this video, though? The idea that there is no true or false, no real objective reality, and that true understanding is impossible? The answer is no. Quite the opposite, in fact. While it's true that all we have to go on is our own first-person experience, all seen through the lens of the mind, it's important to see that we can come to a deeper understanding and knowing about things, especially ourselves. Indeed, what the ideas of this video are telling us is that this thing we call external reality is really a reflection of our own mental state, a reflection of us. The nature of the universe is showing us our own nature, and it's important to be receptive to that lesson. We can do this through meditation and attempting to observe the present moment free from our expectations and prejudices. This requires humility and surrendering our egos. We can also do this through listening to so-called experts, people who have spent a lot of time studying something, but also being critical of what others say or do really analyzing and investigating things we're told through first-person experience. The Dalai Lama has said that one should observe a person for at least 12 years before they become your teacher, which could seem a bit excessive, but it's still important to be aware of who you let become your teachers. When we're young, we absorb the things our parents say and do without really questioning them. They tell us what is right and wrong, and this forms a huge part of the habits and patterns which become our reality. As we get older, we learn to question things and to realize how big the world is. That can be scary, but it can also be exciting. Still, all of this hopefully brings forth more questions than it does answers, which is good. If we want to understand ourselves, see reality as it truly is, that means seeing our own blind spots seeing things from a new perspective, rather than the same ones we always hold, trying to see the world with more empathy and compassion. At the end of the day, that's all we can strive for. Thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please remember to share and like here through YouTube. Also, if you can spare the money and would like to support the making of future videos, please consider donating through my Patreon page link in the description and at the bottom of the video. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.